Hello, good afternoon and welcome. This is the EBRD annual meeting here in San Marcand 2023. My name is Zara Janjua and I will be your moderator for this session, which is titled A New Skills Road, which is all about building human capital in Central Asia. Now, you may have noticed when you arrived that you have some headsets on your seats. Please do use them if you need translation at any point. I should note that our first interview today will take place in Uzbek, so please choose the appropriate channel now. I think we have the details that we can share with you on screen, but you can assign yourself the most appropriate channel to hear a translation in your language. We have Uzbek, Russian and English available. Now, also throughout the panel today, we will have Slido, which is an app we're using to take audience questions. We would really love to have your involvement today. So please use Slido as a web application that you can use in order to submit your questions directly to our panel. As I say, that will be the only way today. We won't have a roaming mic going round. So what you can do is either download Slido. If you have your cameras with you just now, your camera phones, you can take it out, scan the QR codes, and it will take you directly to the page for this session. As I mentioned, we don't have a live mic, so please do get your questions in. We really want you to feel engaged with the panel today. But without further ado, let's get started. Now, Central Asia faces several challenges in relation to its human capital. Outward migration, youth unemployment, even legal barriers to employment. But there is a wealth of opportunity that exists in form of a young, diverse and entrepreneurial population. Today, we'll explore how to unlock this potential and deliver growth and prosperity for the region. To get us started today, it is an honour to be joined by a special guest, Ms. Tanzila Narbaeva, Chairperson of the Senate for the Republic of Uzbekistan and Chair of the Parliamentary Commission for the Promotion of Gender Equality. Please put your hands together and welcome Ms. Narbaeva to the stage. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for joining us, Ms. Narbaeva. Now, Uzbekistan has been very much leading the way on human capital policy agenda in Central Asia. In a large part, that's thanks to the work that you have done and your leadership within the Parliamentary Commission for the promotion of gender equality. Can you tell us a bit more about what your government have been doing and why it's so important for Uzbekistan and the wider region? Assalamu alaikum. It is working. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, Aziz. Today, I am going to talk to you about the people of the Uzbekistan. I am going to talk to you about the Academy of Samarkand Shahr. I am going to talk to you about the Academy of Samarkand Shahr. I am going to talk to you about the Academy of Samarkand Shahr. I am going to talk to you about the Academy of Samarkand Shahr. Ush bu masalani kun tartibiga kiritilganligi uchun Yevropa tiklanish va taraqqiyot bankiga minnatdorlik bildirmoqchiman. Chunki bu masala hamma masalalarda ham eng yuragidagi masala. Bu masala eng asosiy masala va davlatlar qaysi davlat bo'lishidan qat'i nazar rivojlangan bo'ladimi, rivojlanayotgan bo'ladimi yoki bo'lmasam endi endi oyoqqa turayotgan davlat bo'ladimi, hamma uchun bu davlat siyosati bo'lib qabul qilinyapti va bu masalalar bo'yicha hamma davlat rahbariyati siyosiy xayrixohliklarini bildirib, bugun kunda ishlarni yo'lga qo'yyapti. Shu jumladan O'zbekiston davlatida ham birinchi kundan boshlab gender tenglik siyosati, ayollarga ayollarga erkaklar bilan teng imkoniyatlar berish masalasi davlatimiz siyosatining eng ustuvor yo'nalishiga olib chiqilgan va bu borada hozir ishlar tashkil qilinyapti. Men Oliy Majlis Senati raisi bo'lib ishlash 
bilan bir qatorda bir qancha komissiyalarga rahbarlik qilaman. Hozir aytib o'tilgan ayollar va erkaklar uchun teng imkoniyatlar berish va gender tenglik komissiyasi. Bundan tashqari mana shu Yevropa tiklanish taraqqiyot banki uchun muhim bo'lgan boshqa komissiyalar ham bor. Korrupsiyaga qarshi kurashish komissiyasi, odam savdosi va majburiy mehnatga qarshi kurashish komissiyasi, xalqaro reyting va indekslar komissiyasi, milliy barqaror rivojlanish maqsadlarini amalga oshirish parlament komissiyasini rahbarimiz. Shuning uchun bu masala bu masalalar bilan juda ham chuqur shug'ullanamiz. Endi hozir aniq savolni gender masalasi bo'yicha berdingiz shekilli. Shunday tushunyapmanmi? Gender tenglik masalasi bo'yicha bizda oldindan boshlab, mustaqillikni birinchi kundan boshlab davlat siyosati deb aytilardi. Lekin de facto de jure degan narsa bor. Yuridik nuqtai nazardan hamma qonunlarimizda xalqaro standartlar e'tiborga olingan bo'lsa-da, amalda biz davlatimizda juda ortda qolishlar mavjud edi bu masalalar bo'yicha. Mana shu 2016-yildan boshlab davlatimiz taraqqiyotining yangi strategiyalari belgilanishi bilan mana shu masala haqiqatan ham siyosiy bir yuqori darajaga chiqdi. Va bugun aytib o'tishimiz kerak, biz mana shu oxirgi 5-6 yilda ichida 40 dan ortiq normativ huquqiy hujjatlar qabul qildik. Uning asosida eng asosiylari bu bizga xalqaro tashkilotlar, jumladan Birlashgan Millatlar tashkiloti tomonidan tavsiya etilgan asosiy qonunlarni qabul qildik va eng asosiysi yangilik mana yaqindagina bir oygina bo'ldi. Biz ayollar va bolalarga nisbatan zo'ravonlik ta'ziqlarga qarshi qonunlarimizni kuchaytirdik. Ya'ni oilaviy zo'ravonlik ta'rifi bizda kriminallashtirildi. Ya'ni bu oilaviy zo'ravonlik masalalari bo'yicha qonunlar kuchaytirildi. Aytib o'tmoqchimanki, bu borada ishlarimiz davom etyapti. Bu hozir aytganingiz davlat siyosati deganimizda bu nafaqat qonunlar, balki prezident farmonlari, prezident qarorlari, vazirlar mahkamasining qarorlari va idoraviy hujjatlarda eng asosiy yo'nalish xotin qizlarga erkaklar bilan teng imkoniyatlar berish masalasi hamma sohalarda. Shuning uchun juda katta yo'nalishda ishlar boshlangan. Men hali aytmaymanki, juda katta muvaffaqiyatga ko'rsatkichlar bo'yicha erishganmiz deb ayta olmayman, lekin biz to'g'ri yo'lga tushib olganmiz. Parlament tomonidan strategiya qabul qilingan 2030-yilga mo'ljallangan gender tenglikni ta'minlashga qaratilgan strategiya qabul qilingan. Strategiya doirasida har bir yo'nalish bo'yicha biz o'zimizning milliy indikatorlarimizni ishlab chiqqanmiz. Milliy indikatorlarni ishlab chiqishda biz xalqaro tashkilotlarining bizga bergan tavsiyalarni e'tiborga olganmiz. O'zimizdagi muammolarni hammasini inventarizatsiyadan o'tkazib, muammolarni bartaraf qilish yo'llari bo'yicha ularni indikatorlarni kiritganmiz va albatta yoshlarni hozir mana biz hurmatli moderatorimiz aytib o'tdilar, yosh qizlarimizni ularni salohiyatini oshirish, kichkina o'g'il bolalarni salohiyatini oshirish bo'yicha shu masalalar bo'yicha biz alohida dasturlarni qabul qilganmiz. Aytib o'tishim kerak, hozir mana yillar o'tyapti yillar o'tyapti, lekin qisqa muddat ichida bizga hozir mana bitta misol keltiraman. Bizga ayollarda siyosi siyosatda ayollar degan indeks bor, xalqaro parlamentlar aro tashkilotining, bilasizlar, mishparlamentska, mishrab mishparlamentski soyuz 190 ta mamlakatni birlashtiradi. Ya'ni ayollar qonunlarni qabul qilish jarayonida qanaqa salohiyatga ega degan savol bor. Mana shu savolga biz O'zbekiston 128-o'rindan hozir biz 45-o'ringa ko'tarildik. Ya'ni biz parlamentda ayollarning sonini 32% ga yetkazdik. Ijro organlarida ham ayollarni hozir ko'tarish bo'yicha ishlar boshlangan va bu borada nafaqat faol ayollar, balki eng chekka qishloqlardagi qizlarimiz, ayollarimiz, bunda kam ta'minlangan oilalardan bo'lgan ayollarga e'tibor qaratilyapti. Ularni ham birinchi navbatda sifatli tibbiy xizmat ko'rsatilishi, ularni o'qitish masalasi bilan, ayniqsa maktabgacha ta'lim masalasi bilan 100% ga qamrovni yetkazish masalasi, bu bo'yicha qamrov 27% dan 5 yilda ichida hozirgi kunda 30 70% ga yetdi maktabgacha ta'lim bilan. Undan tashqari maktablarda turli yo'nalishdagi maktablarni tashkil qilish, maktablarimizga bolalarimizni qiziqishi bo'yicha qabul qilinishi va maktablarda ikkita til va bitta kasb bilan qo'shimcha bitiruvchilarni chiqarish masalasi davlat siyosati qilib belgilandi. Oliy ta'lim muassasalari bizning mamlakatimizda 
Oli talim masalları 77 de edi. 5 yıl aldın. Hazır ki kunda 199 de oli talim masalları təşkil kılındı. Ve kamru 9 faizden 38 faizge kutarıldı. Ve bizi halkara təşkilatlar, yani bu masam başka devletlerdeki bizi hamkar təşkilat devletlerimiz bizge yordan berişib, koşma, bana şu filiallar təşkil kılış boyu çek, yüzü katta işler alıp barıl yaptı. Yana katta ustu varlık, birinci nabatta yaşlarını bizde bana Uzbekistan, Merkezi Asya'da en Ahalı sahne boyunca katta devlet kısablanadı. Bunu hamalar ingiz bilesler. Tuğuluş kursat kiçi en yukarı. Her yıl 1 milyon ge yakın bala tuğulu yaptı. Demek bana şu balalar ge. Mektap geçe talim muhasseleri kerek. Mektaplar kerek. Tibiyat muhasseleri kerek. Doğru mu? Bunlar için yenge iş uğurları kerek. Bunlar ge ali talim muhasseleri kerek. Ve cüde kub potensialini aşırış boyunca, salakiyatını aşırış boyunca insan kapitalı diyebiz. Şu boyunca türlü muhasseseler kerek. Ve bana şunların rövajlandırış boyunca devletimizde özünün kabul kılgın tarakkiyat strategiyası da 2026 yıl geçe tarakkiyat strategiyası da bana şu masalalar belgelengen üstü varlığı kılıp. Ve bana şu tarakkiyat strategiyası doyarası da kicrasız tarakkiyat strategiyası doyarası da devlet dasturları her yılı kabul kılınladı. Devlet dasturları muhaliyelaştırıladı. Büccetten ve halkara teşkilatlarda kuma gidiyor ham. Çünkü üçün şu orunda ben Avrupa tıklanış tarakiyat bankiye, çünkü katta minnet darlık bildir mahcuman. Çünkü biz ge gender tingliği boyuca ondan artık layihalarda hazır amal gösterişimiz ge yardım bir şey yaptı. Yaşlarımızı salakiyatını aşırış boyuca, çünkü katta yardımlarını bir şey yaptı. Lakin bu hale yeterli emas. Çünkü etkenimde biz mülkiyetimiz tez osu bariyetken mülkiyet ve biz ge her yıl. 600 nafar, 600 bin nafar bala mihnat bazara gekirp geli yaptı. Münasip mihnat e, bilen ularının hamasını tamirleşimiz gerek. Münasip aylık, münasip mihnat şaraitleri, münasip e, hafsız mihnat şaraitleri. E, yani Avrupa Tıklanış Tarakiyat Bankı'nın üstü varlığı bor, hafsız iş uğurlarını yaratmış. Yani halkara mihnat tashkilatı bilen kapirasiya kılıp, hafsız e, iş uğurlarını yaratış bu için hem işlaşımız mümkün boladı. Şunun için bu arada insan kapitalını rövaj Lantırış bu arası da devletimiz oyleyman ki hama kabul kılıyetken konulları dayan, prezident hücretleri dayan, hükümet hücretleri dayan. Aynen bana şu noktaya nazardan gelip çıkayaptı. Çünkü prezident elan kılıngen insan kadrını yükseltiriş baş gaya deyip kabul kılıngen Uzbekistan'da. Demek ki biz köp işleşimiz kere. Bu boyunca yolumuzu tapıp olgamız. Lekin sizler bilen biz <gülüyor> hamkarlık kılışke açıkımız. Yani ne fakat bu band bilen, bugün bana cüdekatta ancuman ot kızılı yaptı. Belki başka bandlar, halkara bandlar bilen, başka halkara teşkilatlar bilen, hama bilen hamkarlık kıladı yon bu sey. Olduğumuzda turgan muamoli masalların bir gelikte halkılamız. Ms. Narbayeva, thank you so much. All the policies you have put in place have made remarkable changes in your country towards achieving equality and equity for young women and girls. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your time. I wish we had more time to speak to you. Please put your hands together and thank Ms. Narbeva. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, this brings us on to our panel session that we have today, and we have some fantastic panelists joining us on stage. Please put your hands together and welcome Mark Keyes, Head of Skills and Employee Division at the OECD. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Sumendra Raut, Chief Financial Officer for Uzbekistan and Azerbaijan at Aqua Power. <laughs> Rano Sidikova. Partner Success Manager, Plug and Play, Women Tech Makers Ambassador and Women Entrepreneurs Mentor. <laughs> Barbara Rambusek, Director of Gender and Economic Inclusion Team at the EBRD. <laughs> and finally, Miriam Ferrin, Deputy Director General of International Partnerships at the European Commission. Your panellists, ladies and gentlemen, now to get us started today, I, I wonder if we could just reflect on the current position of the workforce skills in Central Asia. <laughs> Maybe just one word or one brief thought, we're going to come down the panel and create a sort of mental word cloud, if you would. So, Mark. So when we think about sort of skills, I think that's what we're thinking about. It's about ability, creativity, but uh, also emotional empathy. Thank you, Mark. Sumendra. 
As you said, you have to describe it in one word. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> in my view, it is booming. Oh, interesting. Interesting women. Okay, and Ranu? I would call this huge upcom upcoming potential from emerging market. Thank you so much, Ranu. Barbara? I would say uh, rough diamond. So there is a huge human capital potential, but it needs shaping and developing. Excellent. Thank you. Well, in a less poetic manner, I would have <laughs> said promising, but actually challenging too. <laughs> and promising. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, as I say, I hope that has helped to create a sort of mental word cloud in your head. And it's a great way to kick things off and shape the conversation before we enter into it. Now, we are going to be taking a journey along our very own skills road today. And our first stop brings us to the ambitious Obigaram Norobod Road Project in Tajikistan. برای خالی مسئله میمارندوم، برای کاری در وادار نخلیات کارگری نموده، اویدی برطرف کردنی اون امروزی که برای زنها در کاری سختمانی راه کاری که مانیا و کاری که چیز داده دادن میشود، برای اونها کارگری کرده شده شده است داده است، ما باوری اصول داریم که وقتی نزدیک این نمودی کارها از بین گرفته می شوند اینچنین برای درست فعالیت کردن زنها ما گمان داریم که از مکتب آغاز کردن در کار زنها را با آموزش و گرفتن اختصاص آیدی کارهایی که در ساختمانی را اینچنین در ساحه راهداری فعالیت می کنند گرفته و ما دعوت کنیم در این کارها زنها بیشتر Great to see a project there, obviously focusing on young girls. I mean, Samendra, you mentioned girls. That was uh, your women and, and girls. That was one of the, the suggestions you gave us for our mental word cloud. But Mark, barriers to the economy like those the EBRD is working towards with the government of Tajikistan to remove is just one of the challenges that Central Asia faces in promotion in, of human capital development. What then are the key challenges the region faces in relation to its human capital? And well, how do these affect the economy and the ability to generate medium to long-term growth? Thank you very much for that question, which I think I need about um, another eight hours to answer, <laughs> but I'll try in three minutes. We do have time limits, unfortunately. Let me talk about both challenges and opportunities yeah. and then say a little bit more in detail about sort of the digital and green uh, transformations, because I think that would be very important for the future of Central Asia. So in terms of some global challenges, we know that along with all other countries of the world, Central Asia is facing the mega trends of globalization, digitalization, but also uh, climate change. And these are really changing profoundly sort of our skill demands and there are challenges for uh, the education and training system in Central Asia. So that's sort of the global impact. Then there's some more specific uh, challenges for the region. And that is that at the moment, the region is heavily sort of based upon resources and commodity production. And, but that is shifting and will shift and needs to shift towards a more sort of services and knowledge-based uh, economy. And again, that will change the skills that people will need to learn or that they may need to relearn or, or um, uh, change the skills that they've already learnt to these new ones. So that's some of the specific challenges. In terms of the opportunities, well, it was already mentioned, sort of the region has a very dynamic and young population. We see that old age dependency ratios, the ratio of people aged 65 and over to the working age population is very low in Central Asian countries, between sort of six to sort of 
whereas if we take sort of Europe, it's more like 30 to 40 percent, so a much younger population. But this population needs to be mobilized. They need to be given the right skills so they can quickly enter the labor market and get good quality jo jobs. That's sort of a key f feature. So again, giving them the right skills, not just sort of skilling them for the sake of skilling is important. As part of that, we've heard already, very important to mobilize the talents of women. Yes, we should be encouraging them to take up uh, the STEM uh, skills, that is science, technology, uh, edu engineering, and mathematics, where they often are sort of lagging behind the participation of boys, but they've then got to put those skills to use. And we see a lot of barriers in terms of not having enough childcare facilities to really mobilize those skills. Then if I may, just a few more words just about, uh, if we go in more detail, when we look at the digital revolution, we see every day sort of with ChatGPT that this is changing skills uh, dramatically. What we've seen in, in the OECD's own study of, of automation and skills, we've seen that many skills that we thought couldn't be automated in the past now can be. This includes sort of writing, reading skills, and non-routine skills in general. We're now seeing a shift to much more need for high order uh, skills in terms of complex problem solving skills, uh, higher management skills, but also in s terms of social skills and the skills needed for caring jobs. So there's been this um, very rapid shift that adult education and training systems need to come up with. The green revolution itself, while the evidence is still not all there, we see that that again is shifting uh, the skill demands towards mm -hmm. higher level skills. So we see this upgrading of skills and it's important that uh, Central and Eastern Asian education and training systems re reply to those uh, changes in skill needs. Thank you very much, Mark. You've taken on quite a number of big projects there, a bit of big topics, um, really highlighting the need for the workforce to be future ready and have those future ready skills. Samendra, what do you see as the, the rationale for the private sector to invest in skills? To what extent does the presence or, I guess, the absence of human capital uh, shape, you know, ACLA's investment decisions in, in a country or a region? Thank you for the question. Uh, as I said, the most, important, uh, the most important factor for success of any business is human capital and the skill. And it is also important for the private sector to come in and uh, act as a catalyst, invest in skills without any gender biasness, equal opportunity to everyone, uh, speed up the skill and hire local resources to get success. Uh, Aqua Power Earth Church uh, has taken a lot of initiative in Uzbekistan, uh, in this region, uh, in, uh, in refurbishing a Syrian energy college and uh, employing uh, bright students, uh, both boys and girls. You'll be surprised uh, the ratio is almost 24% uh, out of 234 students are mm -hmm. girl students. Thank so, you. So this is something which is great, which is going on. Mm -hmm. We have done this, uh, we have started this in the year 2021, and as of today, it is 234 students. And, uh, you know, from our team, like engineers, senior people, senior management team, they personally go and, you know, uh, give coaching out there. And we have expert teachers, uh, experts. We hired them from outside and put them as uh, in language teachers, technical teachers uh, to, to, to upgrade the skills so that in future they can be recruited in the energy sector and in aquapower as well. As I say, already two students have been uh, employed by aquapower out of Syrian college. We'll continue to do like this in future. This mm -hmm. is the starting point. We have commitments in Uzbekistan and uh, we'll heavily invest in uh, upskilling. It's, it's great to use Aqua as a case study to understand some of the, the ways in which the theory can be applied. I want to come to you, Rano, to ask them, because we've been talking about you know, human uh, skills, really, through a lens of, of female gen and gender. So you know, what are the biggest challenges um, to groups like young people and women? You know, what do they face in building human capital for the economy tomorrow? Does this sort of limit their ability 
to successfully set up and run a business or to find uh, meaningful employment? Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me for this very, uh, for discussing very this uh, important question. Um, talking about challenges that the youth and uh, women have today, um, there are a few challenges, I would say like big bucket challenges uh, that we can name. Um, one of them is uh, access to education. Um, what I mean by access to education, though education rate is so high in Uzbekistan, but if we look at a number, for example, of universities, where, for example, for uh, um, giving a, a heads up to your second question, like uh, for employment, it is very important to have high education. First of all, it is uh, for mm -hmm. the uh, sake of uh, getting a, a job offer and also for having skills. So um, for from this point, for example, um, last year we had uh, almost 160 um, higher education inst um, institutions, like universities, institutes in Uzbekistan, and almost half of, the, half of them are concentrated in Tashkent. What it means for people, only 4 million uh, people live in Tashkent, 10% of the population, then for the rest of people, so they should make their way to Tashkent. Here we have tri trigger with uh, another cultural aspect when families are not very keen on letting daughters to go to other cities and have some independent life. So um, uh, then uh, we have uh, the numbers of, uh, there are a bit more, 53% um, of girls at the exit from school and then we have a bit more, 55% of uh, men in the universities. And so this is a domino effect that uh, one thing gets to another. And uh, um, so, uh, with this access uh, to education, it is one uh, problem. And another big uh, thing that uh, young people and women are struggling with is financing the education. Education, it costs, and for average, uh, uh, the fam the, uh, for the family with the average income, it is a big bucket expense. And uh, here, though there are dozens of uh, banks that offer um, uh, credits, uh, it is still the uh, terms of loan are still in favorable. So uh, again, uh, people should rely on family financing. And here, uh, again, coming back our cultural aspect, if there is uh, limited resources in the family, there is a higher chance that uh, boys get, uh, 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 there are priority in uh, mm -hmm. financing the education as by default breadwinners in the family. So from all these aspects, uh, yes, so, so finance, access, and also there is a cultural bias with the uh, women being seen in mainly more in the family rather yes. than in the career. We have those aspects, but to a very, on a very positive note, uh, those things are being more talked about uh, in the society and uh, this, uh, those uh, um, barriers are being pushed. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, uh, coming to your second question, uh, then for those people uh, for establishing business or for finding meaningful employment, uh, um, the same uh, challenges, uh, they are there when getting uh, access to uh, employment or uh, establishing business, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, as I said, and uh, I totally, uh, uh, I'm very happy to hear what uh, uh, Tenzila Kamalna said. Uh, those challenges are slowly but surely uh, being uh, taken uh, out of the way. Thank you, Rano. Now, Barbara, Rano's mentioned a number of challenges there facing young women and young people in the region. What then is the role of an investor like EBRD to unlock human capital within the region? So um, EBRD as an investor has, I think, uh, a very important role to play in terms of actually reaching out into the labour market and working directly with private sector and also public sector employers. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have um, as, you know, a fantastic partnership with, with Aqua Power here, uh, but we work across um, all different sectors um, in, in Uzbekistan and, of course, uh, in across the wider region. So how do we do that? Um, we've heard, you know, businesses are con fundamentally constitute two of two things. It's their physical assets and it's their people. And, and we can actually not just help them invest in their physical assets, but also invest in their people and, and raise the awareness and capacity in terms of how to do that. It's the private sector that creates jobs um, and that requires um, skills, um, but that also needs to be or needs to have a role in shaping those skills mm -hmm. and informing what kind of skills will be needed, um, partnerships with universities, with vocational institutions, in order to shape the curricula that, that are being taught and therefore actually young people, young women also, uh, who come through those educational institutions having the right skills, being employable. So that's one thing. And the second thing is also um, lifelong learning and, and updating and upgrading those skills um, on, a, on an ongoing
ongoing basis. So as EBRD, we actively uh, support our clients in, on exactly that journey. Thank you very much. Now, well, this discussion has really focused a lot on the challenges facing Central Asia. It's important not to lose sight of one final point, really, which is the potential that the region holds. And on that note, we're now going to take another stop along our skills road and meet Maria Portanova, an innovative entrepreneur and chocolatier based in Uzbekistan. Ну, наше сотрудничество с EBRD было в самый интересный момент, потому что мастерская испытывала трудности. Летний период продажи шоколада были очень низкие, и, ну, то есть просто не хватало денег, чтобы дать зарплату людям. Вот. И мы решили, приняли решение вводить новый продукт, мороженое. А как это было сделать, как мы клиенту скажем, что мы теперь делаем мороженое, как мы переедем в новое место, потому что там мы в подвальчике бы не поместились. На этом важном этапе, на самом деле, Иберди оказал нам огромную поддержку. Даже не то, что финансово, а просто команда профессионалов, которая помогла а, меня направить, выбрать правильного консультанта, которые помогли нам, поддержали нас. И в течение года были явные результаты у меня в автоматизации, в учете. Мы стали считать ингредиенты, мы стали видеть свою прибыль. А, то есть эффект мы получили сразу через год благодаря этому сотрудничеству. I do hope you all had lunch. Because <laughs> I'm sure if you haven't, you'll be feeling very hungry now after watching that. Uh, Rano, this video shows that even with great ideas, young entrepreneurs might still need a bit of assistance, a little bit of help to realize um, the opportunity or the potential that, that these opportunities present. To unlock, you know, potential growth of this young and diverse segment, what kind of skills do you think Central Asia's young entrepreneurs need to build? Yeah, um, even uh, with a very good degree, with a good education, we uh, those people are getting into entrepreneurial market. They still have uh, to raise uh, a lot of the uh, skills. So one of the most important ones, I think, it is business acumen, when uh, they should be aware of uh, uh, know about uh, marketing principles, about the journey of their customers, uh, financing, strategic planning, so uh, have knowledge on that. And uh, another thing uh, which we uh, at Plug and Play highly stress on is uh, networking and collaboration skills, uh, because uh, now having 16 startups uh, from Uzbekistan on our first acceleration batch, uh, the first thing that we are working on them is on the uh, pitch to investors. So having uh, good networking skills will help them to find the uh, right mentors, uh, investors uh, and will help them along this journey to exert their business quicker. And uh, lastly, um, last but not the least moment is uh, resilience and adaptability, because this is emerging market and especially uh, small businesses, uh, they have uh, different weather every day. And so they sh this adaptability will help them to go through storms and sunny days uh, until their uh, business uh, is uh, uh, solid on both feet. Thank you very much. Now, I, I'm wondering, uh, Samandra, with Aqua Power, you know, it's a company really on the front, front line of a transition to green technology and s consequently in need of a uh, high adaptable skilled workforce. From your experience, what does and, well, doesn't work to build a skilled workforce in the energy sector? And how do you ensure those outdated skills aren't really left behind? Thank you for this question again. As I said, uh, you know, uh, we as a developer and operator, Aqua Power, we, uh, in energy sector, we, we really smell. So this green technology, this transition was smelled by us almost six years ago. When I joined this company, I also found that time there is a team of uh, development team for uh, wind energy and solar energy. As you see today, five years down the line, we have 3.7 gigawatt of solar and wind developed after I came in. Mm -hmm. So Aquapar is always well prepared. Uh, they are strategic thinker. And uh, 
they get resources from international market as a starting point and the knowledge is then cascaded down for example uh, you know we, uh, we signed one uh, green hydrogen project today uh, few months back we hired to uzbek resource we found out it's it's not difficult you can find resources uh, we uh, we find them even if we realize that this knowledge is little bit lacking they are still not there we send them for special trainings to a copper it's a full of knowledge we have 3500 people all across the globe uh, training on job training we have lot of learning platforms like e learning you know sitting here in uzbekistan you can learn several things uh, and uh, we just upskill them uh, in a, in a, because in aquapor digitalization is one of the key to success we use lot of these e learning techniques and we train people even if they are based out of here or anywhere in the world and uh, on job physical training we send them across to the plants train them and uh, send them back uh, and our plans for uzbekistan is to to create a research based center here to create a learning platform here uh, to to have young uzbek uh, resource uh, train them uh, we have sirin college one example we are developing another one for green technology in tashkent we are thinking the replicate the same uh, to in naboi region in bukhara where we are developing our wind power plant so we have a full strategy having said that we are not retiring our experienced or old technology people we pick them up okay you are knowledge knowledgeable and experienced in combined cycle gas fire but now you need to learn about solar technology wind technology uh, green hydrogen uh, we train them and they are up to speed this is how our mm -hmm. planning is we are not retiring people we are you know hiring people from the market and as i said i really respect uh, uzbekistan is sitting with lot of dynamic resources young resources from my personal experience i have been hiring people since last 2 years in my time itself 90% are uzbek mm -hmm. we go hand in hand we work together and uh, i try to coach them teach them so that at one point of time they come and take over it's not expert who will survive uh, who will be employed in the country all the time at one point of time it will be 100% uzbek who will be running our power plants thank you samendra and it's great to hear your investment another data which i must say here oh, yes, is a good please. platform to say you know we have a operator called nomak it's an mm -hmm. aquapower entity and uh, we are just finishing our combined cycle gas fired power plant in end of this year but the hiring has started from now from 3 months back 4 months back we have hired 47 uzbek resource and the team size is 50 wow. only 3 are expert 47 are so you get you yes. get uh, the country sitting with enormous dynamic resources mm -hmm. i respect their talent i respect their keenness to learn <laughs> uh their hard work they and you're tackling the outward migration issue yes. as well within the country which is is really fantastic to hear i want to come to barbara to ask you know um, samantha mentioned there how dynamic the the population can become and i think what is emerging emerging very much from this discussion is just the understanding that of how dynamic the the private sector is and its ability to identify what needs to be done and and really how to do that how does ebrd link its investments to bring the voice of employers and entrepreneurs to shape policy reforms so i think that's that's another important um, role that ebrd plays you know we, i i talked earlier about um how we work with our private sector partners uh, to recognize the importance of skills and do something about that but we can actually bring that voice into shaping policy solutions so for example in kazakhstan we brought the the, the voice of Uh, companies in the energy sector in order to lift labor market restrictions that existed for women to work in certain types of jobs because fundamentally what that meant is that companies could only fish in half the talent pool um, and so it was in the company's interest to expand that talent pool particularly for those companies that actually work in very remote regions um, in order to be profitable in order to to be able to innovate and and, and to grow um, so it it is that uh, connectivity and that bridge function in a way that that we can play we do the same on skills we help develop something called sector skills councils where we bring together the private sector in a particular sector from hospitality and tourism to engineering to to many others um in order to shape national occupational skill standards um um and and really shape what's actually happening what's being taught in classrooms across the country 
Thank you very much. I, as I say, what I think is emerging very strongly from this discussion is really the understanding that the private sector is crucial for designing public policy that allows it to flourish. Moving away from Central Asia, let's take our final stop on our skills road to look at an example of how EBRD is using these lessons to develop skills in Jordan's tourism sector. Tourism is a very labor-intensive industry. In Jordan, we have always faced an issue with skilled labor as many other touristic destinations. And we have always, as a private sector, wanted to partner with policymakers to help improve the product of the education system and the skills development systems. EBRD has provided us with technical support and a clear model in human capital development to become the voice of the private sector in skills governance. We have achieved a lot during the journey. We developed over 26 national occupation standards and some relevant curricula. Some never existed before, such as the Adventure Tool Guide. We also launched the first job portal for the tourism sector. And currently, we are working on a national level strategy for skills development that will guide all stakeholders involved in skills development and tourism. Being supported by EBRD brought weight and credibility for this process. Beautiful pictures there. Doesn't it just make you want to visit Jordan? It's beautiful, I loved watching that VT. Now, Miriam, this was just one example of how international institutions such as the EBRD can use their leverage to bring together the private and public sectors to support the development of skills in response to the needs of the local economy. Let's look at an, another example. How does the EU, through Global Gateway then, support skills development in Central Asia? Thank you. Well, support to skills is fundamental, as we all know, to generate sustainable growth. And this is why education, in the wider sense of the term, is one of the key priorities of the sustainable strategy uh, global gateway. This strategy has been adopted end of last year and its objective is to help the countries and help our partners meet the sustainable development goals in all key challenges and essentially the global challenges. And of course, access to skills is one of the key challenges. So the way we work and I think there is a word which we have heard a lot from all the previous for, um, speakers is in partnership. We start with ourselves and in order to have impact, we work within the European Union with all the key partners in what we call a Team Europe approach. So we work with the drawing on the expertise of our member states and we have member states which are very high ranking in terms of education, I have Finland in mind. And if I quote Finland, it's because our commissioner, the commissioner for international partnership in the European Commission, Jutta Opilainen, is not only Finnish, but has put education as her number one priority. And this is one of the reasons why we consider education so important. And again, when I'm saying education, I'm meaning access to skill, long life learning, uh, and primary or secondary. So this priority is implemented by joining forces within the European Union with all our partners, including financial institutions, including the BRD, including in particular the European Training Foundation, which is an internal agency located in Torino, in Italy. So we bring all partners together to help our partners. And we work with the government first and with all strands of society. And for us, the other side of the partnership is having a comprehensive approach and kind of a platform of stakeholders with whom we bring expertise. We have a full set of tools that we can deploy, starting with technical assistance and transfer of knowledge and expertise, 
And this is done in particular in Central Asia and in other countries. It, with the countries with whom we have a sufficient level of confidence, we do consider that budget support is the best tool because this allows us to have a full-fledged policy dialogue with the government. And what matters in terms of education, as was said, is that all key players of the chain speak to each other, starting from primary education, but within the government, you need to have a dialogue, an interministerial dialogue between the ministers for education, for labor, for sexual mm -hmm. policies. And the, it starts with a comprehensive approach within the government, which the EU support can strengthen via policy dialogue, via financial assistance, via provision of experts that can work hand in hand in the administration. It also means that we reach out to the private sector, and I very much like the EBRD example, which I think we are supporting also. What we can do is set up this kind of platforms mm -hmm. at national level in specific sectors. Mm -hmm. so the, I think we have a, a joint platform between Turkey and Jordan also mm -hmm. around the tourism sector, where you can put all the players, the private sector, the employers, the civil society in some times, the national governments to try to define the needs. And what is striking in, the, in the, the moment we are living in is that most of the jobs that our own kids will be using in a few decades don't even exist now. Mm -hmm. And those will be developed, as we speak, you mentioned, uh, well, someone mentioned um, artificial intelligence, but the uh, labor market is changing at such a speed today that we need to have a lot of flexibility and a lot of partnership between all key players to be able to define the right qualifications framework. Mm -hmm. So the way we work is by setting platforms. We also work with the private sector, um, which of course, on the other end, is considered as the employer, but also as a provider of qualifications. We have a lot of projects where we can de-risk investments in exchange of private companies setting up training programs and employing local population or collaborating with universities. So we have all this set of tools from direct financial assistance to provision of expertise. Of course, one very well-known program, I can't leave this state without Thank mentioning you. Erasmus, mm -hmm. which I think is the flagship yeah. of the European Union. So both in terms of mobility, we can have exchanges for students between European countries and our part of countries. We also support universities directly uh, through capacity building in, uh, in universities. And last, we have one specific recent program for the five Central Asian countries, which we call DARIA, and which is implemented by the European Training Foundation, which aims at defining um, new models of cooperation for the definition of the qualification framework that will allow employability of the young generation in certain sectors. Thank you. So, full, full set of tools and clearly a top priority uh, to be implemented in full partnership with the beneficiary countries and their society at large. Thank you for the, the comprehensive insight into Global Gateway. I think that leads us nicely on to potentially some questions. And Mark, um, there's one that's come for you. Uh, what do you see as innovations or examples of best practice of policy solutions to build skills and human capital? Which of these do you think work particularly well for the challenges and opportunities we face in Central Asia? Thank you, Zara. I think, yeah, what's really important and I'd like to focus actually is on adult learning systems and, and what needs to be done to sort of improve uh, those systems and, and make them uh, future ready. Because we talk a lot about initial education, but if we don't help those young people and the current workforce keep their skills uh, up to date, then we will uh, have uh, costly sort of skill shortages, and that is a loss both to individuals themselves, but also to firms in terms of profitability. And adult learning systems are often the poor cousin of the education and learning system. Uh, there's less investment in them than in initial education, but as I said, very crucial. They need to be improved in two ways. They need to be made more inclusive, but they also need to be well aligned with actual labor market needs and the skill needs of employers in particular. 
In terms of inclusivity, we see that uh, lower skilled individuals and workers, but precisely those groups that will be hurt by automation, get the least training. Mm. And we see there's also a big uh, age gap with, again, older workers uh, getting much less training uh, than younger workers. What can we do about this in terms of good practice? Well, we need to address th the barriers um, to training. And we see, for example, that um, countries uh, like uh, uh, Spain have actually introduced more modular courses so that they can help with time constraints that both firms and individuals face. And so their courses now are on a modular basis. They build up uh, to uh, qualification. They've also introduced uh, micro-credentials, which is a faster way, again, of getting recognition for people's uh, skills. The second element, of course, is alignment. So what can Central Asia do about better aligning the skills that they're giving both to young people but also to uh, older workers? Well, there's a need for better labour market intelligence, and this includes uh, skills assessment and anticipation uh, exercises. Now, we see many countries are doing this, but it can be done at a, in a better way, both at a national, sectoral, uh, and regional uh, level. And this involves sort of, of course, bringing all of the partners together, and this has been mentioned before. So the private sector needs to be part of these exercises. The governments, the training institutions and education institutes need to be uh, part of this. And of course, uh, the representatives of uh, workers need to be part of it. But it's not just enough uh, to do this. We see that you need to disseminate the exercises or the results of these uh, ant assessment and anticipation exercises. I've seen countries like Sweden where they do an excellent job at all of these different levels, national, sectoral, and regional, in very complex uh, exercises. But then there's a failure of dissemination. So that information is not getting to all mm -hmm. of the actors that need and could use uh, that uh, information. So it's something that has to be learnt. And again, I think there are other mistakes that can be sort of learnt as well for Central uh, Asia from um, some European countries. Many European countries want to jump a level, go straight to higher education, sort of upgrade all young people to sort of a university education. I think that's been a costly mistake and we need to keep a vibrant vocational education and training uh, institutes alive because they are crucial skills that will be increasingly uh, important and will remain important. And we need to keep that sector alive and not put all of our investments in uh, the higher, just purely in higher education. Mark, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for submitting questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to dedicate a little bit more time to doing that. It's been a wonderful discussion here with our panel. Every single speaker we've had, I think, has shown us a bright future ahead for the region. And honestly, I wish I could sit here for another hour at least and, and speak to you all about it. Thank you so much for your input. Please put your hands together and thank our panelists, Mark Keyes, Samendra Root, Rano Sidikova, Barbara Rambusek, and Mariam Ferrin. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, we do have a special guest who is here to help us close this session. Joining us now, we have Anita Bhatia, who's the founder of the Impact Collaborative and former Deputy Executive Director of UN Women. Uh, Anita, thank you very much for joining us. I know that you've been very much waiting in the wings, listening into our panel session. Perhaps you would like to reflect on some of the key points we raised. Thank you so much. And <coughs> really enjoyed listening to this discussion here early in the morning in Washington, DC. Um, <clears throat> let me just pick up on a few points that were made to close out this really interesting panel. First, I think it was really interesting to hear from uh, Ms. Narvayeva about the investments that Uzbekistan is making to increase the participation of women uh, in the educational system. And it was really great to hear the ambition about moving this number from 27% to a much higher number. And I also really enjoyed hearing from the other panelists about some very specific things that are being done in business and in the private sector to address the skills gap in Central Asia. Overall, I would say I think there were three big themes that emerged. First, the need to close the gap between the supply 
of labor and the demand for labor by making sure that there is investment in the right kinds of education. So really appreciated Mark's point on the need not just to have formal education systems, but also vocational systems. Um, we heard very clearly about the need for business to play a role in this. And so Mainzra outlined some really interesting examples of how business can play a leadership role by role modeling what is needed and ensuring that it's not just experts, but also local capacity that is being leveraged. Uh, I loved the picture of the chocolates. <laughs> I was wishing I was there. And so it was great to see entrepreneurship in action through that video uh, and the lessons that Rano shared. Um, and I also really appreciated what Barbara mentioned about not just examples from Uzbekistan, but also from other parts of the world where EBRD is clearly playing a very important role with both the public sector and the private sector in ensuring that this mismatch that you see very often and this failure to translate employment, uh, education into employment is being addressed. And then finally, I think, uh, you know, what we heard from um, the European Commission about certain skills programs, whether an educational programs, the emphasis that the commissioner is putting on education, learning from the examples of Finland and other countries is illustrative. Overall, I would say the one word that I think we want to bring into the dialogue is how all of this matters to make countries like Uzbekistan much more competitive. Because the human capital potential, uh, not just of women, but of all people, is really uh, what needs to be leveraged. And I think as Central Asia sets off on this journey to close this gap between uh, education and employment possibilities, it is really important to look at the experience of other regions where lots of women are being educated today, but because of things like the cultural bias, the lack of access to financing for education, that investment in education does not always translate into employment. So just something to keep in mind that it isn't enough just to create the policy framework to have the involvement of the private and the public sectors in creating those frameworks. It is really also important to work on those hidden biases that get in the way of that education becoming something tangible and real for women and for the rest of the population, particularly the young population. Thank you so much. Anita Bhatia, thank you very much. Thank you. I think it's wonderful to hear Anita's reflections and to understand the opportunity that does exist. I think today we've come together to hear a number of case studies. We've actually seen some of those case studies. And Anita, you mentioned one, of course, that, that tantalized you as much as it did me, the chocolatier, of course, based here in Uzbekistan, because it's through those human stories that we really do connect those policies on page. And uh, I hope that you all do see the hope in the future in the region. What we would like to ask you all to do really is moving forward to not just enjoy the rest of this annual meeting here today in San Marcan and of course tomorrow, but when you are attending meetings, when you're having um, either other meetings or, or networking events, or indeed when you're discussing policy, to try and do that through a human capital lens. Uh, together, if we do that, we can build a more prosperous, a more inclusive and a more sustainable world. We really do hope that you enjoy the rest of the EBRD annual meeting here in San Marcan 2023. Have a lovely afternoon. We wish you well. Thank you. Thank you. Doesn't it just fly in?